Well, good morning. So the point of that is that some of us are living without power and in captivity when we don't have to be. And so we're going to talk about that today. But first, I want to introduce some of our newest members. David and Priscilla Horea have joined our church, and so we're glad to have them. And I'm a little slow at bringing you your things, but thank you guys. We love you guys. And they come to Sunday school, so they're some of my favorites. That's how it works. You get extra credit if you come to see me at nine, so good to see you. Ernie looks at me today and he goes, did you take Sudafed? And I said, yes. And he goes, yay. And I was like, that seems like an odd way to be excited about my allergies. <clears throat> Does it increase ADD? Is that what you're thinking? <clears throat> it is good to see you guys today. We have driven many, many miles in the last few days. My nephew was married in Charleston, South Carolina. I finally got it right. I keep trying to say Charlotte. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And so we drove there and drove back. And South Carolina has not invested money in their roads since 1953. <laughs> and so thankfully, we did not catch any accidents on the way up or on the way back. But we saw some on the other side. And we felt sorry for those people. And all I could think was, thank you, Jesus. But uh, today we're going to look at the most unusual uh, what I feel is the most unusual story in the Bible. It's actually there are a few times about two men, but in Mark chapter 5, we look at this man possessed by a demon and he's healed, which is a story that you're like, well, how can we get practical application from that? Well, I'm going to show you how. And uh, we're talking about it. What Mark was trying to show is the power of Jesus and how powerful Jesus was. Now, I don't know if you have ever felt powerful, but a few months ago... We went to Breckenridge, Colorado, and I did not ski, but I went sledding, and Ricky and Brooke and I went sledding, and we got to the sledding place, which was really cool. It, was just a, it wasn't a paid sledding place. It was a, just a park with a hill, and so I had brought these because I'm cheap, so I got on Amazon and spent eight bucks and blew these up. And so I said, Ricky, here's your thing. Blow it up. And I started blowing mine up. And the next thing I know, I look over at Ricky, and he is sitting on the ground. And I said, are you okay? He goes, I don't know. I'm just, just tired. And I'm like, man, I feel great. And so I said, well, keep blowing it up. See ya. And I went to the top of the hill, <laughs> slid down. Brooke stayed with him. I came back, said, you doing any better? I don't feel great. So I finished blowing it up for him. We walked up to the top. He stopped 12 times. Now, you've got to realize what happens when you're a dad and you feel like age is starting to catch you and that your kids are now bouncing much better than you are and, and your engine check light has come on. Anytime you win, you feel awesome. You're like walking and you're like, are you okay? Yeah. So I go back and, and he's just sitting there and I'm taking lap after lap around him, but I cheated. He didn't know I cheated because the last time I went at high altitude, I was sick for three days. It's miserable. How many of you have ever had altitude sickness? Anybody in here? If you have never had altitude sickness, it's a combination of seasickness, the flu, and misery soup. It is just this awful feeling, and you keep thinking, I know I'm going to feel better soon. Nay, nay. You do not. You feel awful and you just want to lay down. Well, before we went this time, Kristen said, you know, you ought to take the medicine before you go to altitude. I said, what? She said, you take this pill a few days before and it makes your blood bionic. She didn't say that. That's... And it grabs on to the oxygen, and then you feel good. So I'm up there. Three days before, I had taken the medicine. And so I got there, and I had superhuman blood. And I'm just walking up and sliding down. And what's wrong with you guys? Every, all the kids are in the, in the room. Oh. oh, and I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with you guys. What you need? You want the coffee? Man, that's good. Right? We went and bought them oxygen. I'm just running around like a madman. No thanks. Don't need any oxygen. I'll take some just for fun. Okay, here you go. By the way, they started selling oxygen locally at Publix. I, what? Yeah, just in case you can't get enough by going to the ocean. Anyway, so, but it was awesome. But I cheated. 
And because I knew what the deal was, I had more power than anybody. And can I tell you something? It feels good to realize, wow, I'm able to do this. Listen, so many people today are living as Christians without God's power. And they're miserable. And they, sometimes it's because they're not believers. They've never given their lives to Christ. Other times it's because of choices we make when we stay in the shed, when God has set us free, and yet we allow disobedience and other things to, to chain us to old ways of thinking. Some of us, even old thinking, old thoughts, ways we grew up, regrets, unforgiveness, all kinds of things can chain us down. And so today I want to talk about this whole idea of walking in power. Because you can walk in bondage. It's miserable. It's miserable. Or you can walk in God's power. And so I'm going to give you just some practical ideas about this. But the overall picture today is to recognize that God has power to do this. This is what Mark was trying to show and, and Mark concentrated on one person in this story where the other gospels show both guys who were in bondage. Mark just talks about the one guy. And so we're going to pick up on what I like to call the poltergeist passage. And, uh, uh, and this is what we're going to talk about first. Number one, are you willing to surrender to Christ? Are you willing to surrender to Christ? So here we pick up Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. They went across the lake, and by the way, that's when the storm came up, and, and Jesus calmed the storm, to the region of Gerasenes. And by the way, we don't know exactly what the region's called, so in different verses of the Bible, they may have a little different spelling of this. But it's kind of like me saying I live in Chuliota, or I live in Oviedo, or if I'm somewhere else and somebody says, where are you from? I just say Orlando. I've given up. Just Orlando, Right? And so that's what this is. It's an area. We know where it is. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Time out. You notice here, it doesn't say that the disciples got out with him. It's almost like the disciples were like, they see this dude and they know about him screaming all night. They know about him breaking chains. They know about his life. He's covered with blood and sores and he comes walking out and the disciples are like, Okay, go ahead, Jesus. We'll be right here to back you up. So Jesus gets out of the boat, and that's what happens next. So the man lived in the tombs, and listen to this. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. So this guy's like the Andre the Giant. Two weeks in a row with an Andre the Giant reference. This guy's like, just, just break anything they put on him. And then it continues. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and he broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And in the Greek, this word subdue him is the idea of like a, an animal tamer. So it almost gives you the idea that they called an animal tamer in. Like when he was a little calmer, they said, dude, you fix him. And maybe they were able to get some chains on him. And then all of a sudden he could just break them. And then it continued. Night and day among the tombs. By the way, three different times it talks about the tombs. This is a place where people were taking their relatives to bury them. It did not smell good. This was, this was before burying people. They just put them in the back of the tomb. Night and day, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So if you lived in a town nearby, you would hear at night werewolves or wolves, and you would hear him. Can you imagine how terrifying that was? Cutting himself in anguish, yelling. So you can see why the disciples were like, Jesus, you go first. And then it continues. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Most people think that this is a moment that the demons didn't control him. And he ran so he could worship Jesus. He could surrender to Christ. That he could say, I can't handle this. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice. Time out. Top of his voice? Have you ever? I mean, you've probably been yelled at. Have you ever had somebody 
yell at the top, like the loudest they could yell. And somebody in this condition, I don't know about you, but I'd be backing up. But he comes and he yells at the top of his voice. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said, by the way, kept on saying to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Now, I want to give you a, a practical note about this. Here's a man tormented by demons. Jesus goes up to him and is telling the spirits to come out of him. And he has to do it over and over again. So why do you think if you struggle with a habit or a hurt or a hang up that you're just going to pray one time and God's going to take care of it when Jesus himself is there. By the way, there's another time where a blind man comes to Jesus. Jesus lays hands on the guy and then says, what do you see now? And the guy's like basically blurry. He says, I see people like trees. And Jesus is like, he'll come back. Let's do this again. If Jesus had to do over and over healing on people, then guess what? If you have struggled with unforgiveness, if you've struggled with people telling you something and you have problems with the way your thoughts are, if you struggle with a habit or a sin habit in your life, don't think, oh, I'm just going to pray one time and it's going away. God might do that. I, I tell people all the time, God sometimes microwaves people. He really does. But most of the time, God crockpots people, right? So I would love it if you just had a habit. Like, you know, maybe you struggle with the donuts on Sunday morning like the pastor. Kristen, I did not eat a donut this morning in the last five minutes. Um, so it was 10 minutes ago. But um, so maybe you struggle with something and, and you just hope that God will take it away. Most likely, you're going to have to work towards what God's doing with you. If Jesus has to command more than once for the demons to come out, your old habits that you grew up with, maybe abuse, maybe what somebody told you about you, and you think, when are these thoughts going to go away? Keep calling them out. Keep paying attention to the fact that they're wrong. Keep saying that way of thinking is wrong. Keep reading your Bible and saying, God, would you pour scripture in me? If you need to, you go to a counselor. You get an accountability group. You get some people who can help you. You don't have to do this on your own. By the way, this guy could not heal himself. That was thunder in the background. I like that. What's a stronghold you're dealing with? Now, when we were kids. We had a horrible game. I hope kids don't play this anymore. As soon as I say it, you're going to all nod your heads because you've played it. If, if you had an older brother, you definitely played it. It was called mercy. Yeah, see? See, the kids in here are like, I never heard of that. Good. How many of you have heard of mercy? I don't want to ask which one of you won because we don't like you. Because if you're a little brother, your older brother always wanted to play mercy when you didn't want to play mercy, right? And he'd come up and grab your hands and bend them back until you said the word mercy. mercy. And sometimes he would wait just a second or two extra just to hurt you a little bit. So great to have older brothers, isn't it? So he would say mercy and, and hopefully let go. That's how the game was played. And the truth is, though, even if you were little, even if you didn't want to play, even if you knew you were going to get hurt, you would try to resist just a little bit. But you knew pretty quickly, oh, and when the pain got enough, you said mercy. Some of us, the pain hasn't gotten bad enough for us to recognize that we need God's mercy. One of the truths about obedience is we can't even be obedient to God, ready, without his help. So here's the first question. Have you grown tired of the pain from sin? You will not change until you're ready to change. That thought process you have, that struggle that you struggle with, and the truth is, even when you begin to deal with it, just like it took Jesus over and over. Jesus, God himself, saying, come out of him. And the demons are like, not yet. 
You may struggle over and over, but you first have to get to the point of going, I'm tired of living this way. I don't want to be this way. The people in AA, what do they say? They say, hey, I'm broken. I'm helpless without God's help. And so you've got to come to the point of recognizing I'm helpless. God, I need your mercy to help me. Number two, do we like our sin more than people? It was really funny this morning. I was thinking about something with this sermon. And I am an extrovert that is task-oriented, which means that when I'm doing a task, I favor the task over people. As much as I like people, when I'm doing something, I want to be left alone, which is a great way to not respond properly to people while I'm doing a task. You get it? My wife, however, is an introvert who likes people over tasks. So she's teaching me how to care about people more than what I'm doing. Sometimes if we're not careful, if we're honest, we actually care more about our sin or our stronghold or our habit than we do about the people in our lives. And so our problem is not really the habit or the hurt or the hang up. Our problem is that we have not prioritized people. Do you know what this is? Can you see what it is? It's a charging cord, right? For a phone. How many of you ever plugged your phone in at night and woke up in the morning and your phone was not charged? And like me, maybe you woke up in the morning and said, why didn't this dumb phone charge? And then you pulled your phone away and realized you had not plugged it in. You can't just do whatever you want and expect to have power. <clears throat> you can't, as a believer, do whatever you want and think you'll have God's power. If you think you're going to walk in disobedience, just do whatever you want. Tell God, hey God, you bless my life as I do whatever I want. And then you wonder why you have no power in the Christian life. Because power only comes through obedience. And obedience only comes with the help of Christ. And when you say to God, God, I want to do whatever I want, but I want you to bless it. God, I want to live my life the way I want, make the choices I want, do whatever I want to do when I want to do it, but I want you to bless it. God says, nay, nay. That's not how it works. You can have all the right equipment. You can be a believer and love God, and yet not walk with him. My daughter's trying to call me. My kids love to call me during church. <laughs> Verse 9. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? I don't care what scary movie you've seen. It is nothing compared to what happens next. Because I don't know who talked, but it was not fun. I used to love to scare my sister. My mom says it's the worst thing I did. And I'm like, you didn't know me real well. <laughs> but I, I can do lots of voices. And so, especially at night, I would freak my sister Kelly out by doing voices. And she's, you know, she'd say something to me like, hey, Eric, can you pick that up? And I'd go, Eric is no longer here. <laughs> and she'd go, oh, don't do that. And I go, do what? You know. So it says, what is your name? My name is Legion. Now, Legion meant over 6,000 soldiers. And I love that scholars argue about how many demons were there. Let me tell you how many were there. I don't know. He called himself Legion. But Satan's a liar. So what are you supposed to believe? There were a bunch of them there, though. And then he continues. For we are many. And then listen to this. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. So who was talking? The demon was talking through the dude. And then listen to this. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. By the way, back then, pigs fed on everything. One of the reasons that pork was unclean is they literally fed on everything and anything. Dead carcasses, 
everything. And so it was very dangerous to eat pork during this day. And the Jews forbid pork for good reason. And so we don't know if these guys were working for for Jews who wanted bacon and pork chops and ribs on the side. Or if they were just working for the Samaritans. By the way, the Samaritans hated the Jews so much that what they did is they would take a pig carcass when they were rebuilding the temple and throw it into the temple so work would have to take off uh, uh, for days until the time of the purification was over. Now you see why Samaritans and Jews didn't get along, right? So then it continues. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out, went into the pigs, the herd. Listen to this. 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. These animals did not have self-control. The guy's cutting himself. He's trying to commit suicide, which is demonic in itself. The guy is trying. And yet when Jesus sends him into the pig, the pigs rush down the hillside and they all die. Wait a second. Moment of silence for all that bacon. And listen to this. When they came, so those tending the pigs ran off, which I would think you would do, like all my pigs just ran down the hillside and committed suicide. All of them would rather be dead than filled with demons. So those tending the pigs ran off, reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what happened. By the way, I think one of the reasons that Jesus gave them permission to go into the pigs is so that people recognize that there was something really going on with this guy. It wasn't just mental illness. It wasn't just a chemical imbalance. He didn't just have too much sugar that morning. There was a real demonic issue. And then it says this, When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Year after year, they had seen this guy by the tombs. Year after year at night, by the way, no air conditioning, no windows. So at night, you would hear the guy screaming over and over. And they go and they see the guy there in his right mind and they're afraid. And so they said to Jesus, those who had seen it, it says, told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and then about the pigs as well. Like, do you see all those carcasses floating onto the bank? of? The, I mean, thousands of pigs just floating right there. Can you imagine? Then the people began to plead with Jesus, come and heal my neighbor. Come and hear my family member. Come and help me. If you can help that guy, you can help anything. Isn't that what they said? No. They said, could you get out of here? You've messed up our pork. You've messed up our rib sandwiches. The McRib. That's not real rib. You've messed up my bacon quota. You've messed up my income. I'm more concerned about the pig you killed than the guy you healed. Did you hear what I just said? I'm more concerned that you didn't do what I wanted you to do And you messed with something I cared about. See, when we really want to get serious about obedience, we have to be willing to say, God, whatever you want to do. Obedience often means sacrificing something else that we like. It might mean giving up something where we struggle because of something that leads us into. If you struggle with alcoholism, my guess is you're going to have to give up going to bars. But I enjoy the darts. Yeah. But I enjoy the fellowship at the bar. Yeah. What relationship do you need to prioritize? These guys were more concerned about the pigs than the people. And if you're task oriented and you're not careful, you're more concerned about the dishes than the people in your house. You're more concerned about getting somewhere than caring about the people around you. You're more concerned about finishing a task than the people that you're doing the task for. 
One of the reasons we have small groups at our church is small groups is the way that you grow. If you're not in some kind of small group or team, there's no way for you to prioritize people. You make time for the things you want to make time for. Jesus said, love God and love people. So my question is, what are we doing to love people? The only way you can love people is to be in relationship with them. And let me tell you something about being in relationship with people. You get to know people and you figure out that they are messed up. And you get around people and sometimes you're driving away and you say, hey honey, did I sound dumb when I said that? And she says, yes. And you blow it too. Because we're people. But people need each other. And so is there... A priority in your life for people. Number three, are we walking in freedom and obedience? Remember, obedience leads to power, which means disobedience is like unplugging the power. That's why we have confession. By the way, confession isn't for God's sake. When you confess sin and you say, God, I'm really sorry I did ABC, God doesn't go, what? I think sometimes he says, finally, we confess our sins. He's purifying our hearts. And sometimes it's for our recognition to realize we have bad attitudes, bad actions, and it helps to change us as we confess our sins. Listen, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him. Listen to this. Jesus answered the demon's request. Jesus answered the people's request. And Jesus told this guy, no. Sometimes if you're obedient to Jesus, you don't get to do what everybody else does. Sometimes when you're obedient to God, he tells you no when he told somebody else yes. You don't always get what they get, but then it continues. Go home to your own people. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had, here is the word again, mercy on you. So the man went away, began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Everywhere this guy went, he would say, hey, you remember the screaming that you used to hear at night? Oh, man, yeah, it stopped recently. Yeah, that was me. Jesus saved me. Do you have a story like that? I would love to tell you, that my altitude story is over, but it's just beginning. Because I went to buy these shoes. And Kristen and I went and we got BOGO shoes up in the big city of Titusville. Where, by the way, when we were on vacation, somebody told us that they come every winter to Florida. And we said, really? And they said, yes, to Titusville. On purpose? So we went to Titusville to Rack Room Shoes. Great deal, right? So we're in Rack Room Shoes. As we're checking out, the guy at the checkout stand says, I'm getting ready to go hiking overseas in the mountains. And do you remember what mountain he said? Kilimanjaro or something. And I said to him, I said, well, well, well how high is that? He goes, oh, I don't know, way over 10,000 feet. I said, oh, you know what you need to do before you go. You need to take this pill so that when you get there, you'll be ready to hike. You'll be ready to go because you took this. It's going to make it where you're ready for the altitude. Listen, if Jesus has really saved you, if you can look back and see how your life has changed, if you remember what life was like before Jesus, then as you go, you'll run into people who talk about discouragement and talk about loneliness and talk about sadness and talk about running from God or they're not sure that God is real. And you'll have opportunities to say, but let me tell you what he did for me. And I want to encourage you to always be looking for an opportunity to say what Jesus has done for you? Are you sharing what God has done for you? I want you to have power. I want you to go through life and have his power. I want you to deal with your hang-ups, your hurts, your habits, and surrender them and ask for God's mercy. And when you fail and fall again, to do it again and say, God, I really need your help. Would you guide me to how I can get help and grow in this area? Because until you're able to walk in obedience, the power in your life will be lacking and you'll struggle and you'll be frustrated. But when you surrender, 
And when he begins to take away those strongholds in your life, you find the joy of the Christian life that you've never had before. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died for our sins because we're all messed up and broken and we need his forgiveness. And if you're here today and you want to give your life to him knowing that Jesus died and rose again, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service, so just come. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, uh, the Holy Spirit put his finger on something in your life, maybe a habit, maybe a hurt, maybe a hang-up that you need to deal with. Don't just leave it here. Don't just let the, the seed die, but let God plant that seed and begin to work on you. If you need help, you send us a note, an email, a text, and we'll do our best to get you pointed the right way to get you to begin to get out of that hurt habit or hang-up. We're going to have our offering in just a minute, but we're going to close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word, your strength, your power, your love. Lord, I thank you for all you've done for me. As I look back in life and see the changes you've brought in my life, I'm thankful. Lord, I thank you for each one here, and I know there's so many stories here. Lord, help us not to just hold on to those stories for ourselves, but to look for opportunities to share with others what you've done so that they can find the freedom that we've been given. We thank you for freedom in you today. Thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.